Hi everybody. Um, today we're going to talk about descriptive methods of study, descriptive designs. And this is a research method where we're simply describing human uh, or animal behavior. And it uh, we have some goals that we want to make sure we cover during this video, so pay close attention. Uh, remember, you can always stop and rewind um, and use your notes and take notes as you go along. Uh, we will discuss and complete some activities uh, tomorrow in class when you're completed. Um, remember what descriptive designs, we're, we're probably um, looking at a variety of behaviors. So um, we're not in a laboratory typically, um, but we can be. So we want to keep that separate from experimental methods. Okay. So our objectives after watching this video and reading your text on page 24 through 29, you should be able to answer the following questions. I'm not going to go over all these questions, but they're there for you to kind of guide, so make sure you take a look at those questions. Um, the AP um, gurus who and ETS are going to ask some questions based on these things, as I will as well. So remember, um, try to use your Cornell notes and rewind if you need to, okay? So let's get started. Um, so descriptive designs, um, these are designs that kind of complete the first goal of psychology, which is to um, identify human behavior, thought processes, and tendencies. Now remember, the big, the big thing here is to remember that only experimental methods can allow us to conclude cause and effect. Descriptive designs do not allow us to do that, and we'll have to be able to explain why with each of our methods. So we're going to focus on the three major approaches. The first is a case study. Um, and the second one is naturalistic observation. And the third one is the use of surveys. And you've probably used all of these before to make conclusions about people already. Um, we're going to just talk about how it's done a little more precisely. Okay. So we're going to look at case studies first. Now, case studies involve an in-depth examination um, of a single person or at least a small group of people, um, typically when somebody's exhibiting some unusual or unexpected behavior. Maybe it's rare behavior as well, um, behavior that we don't typically see somebody do. Um, it's probably most frequently employed in clinical psychology where we have uh, a sample size of one person and this person's exhibiting behavior that is not typical for that person. We're going to um, possibly examine people with special skill sets, extremely high IQs, or people who have exhibited behavior um, that's dangerous to others in some way. So we, we might use interviews. Um, we certainly can um, use for our data um, surveys, we can ask people questions, and, and we can also take a look at records that already exist. So there's a lot of different ways we can examine um, information and gather data, whether it be interviews, surveys, look at people's records, like their school records, their work records, um, what type of test scores they had, etc. So the strengths of case studies, now they do expand our knowledge about the variation of human behavior. So um, we, we might see a wide variety of, of behavior um, exhibited in case studies. Um, remember, the, the information that's gathered can be very daunting because there's a lot of different places we can get this information. So it can actually overwhelm us from time to time. And um, we, we probably want to establish beforehand what type of information we're looking for. And the biggest strength is it can help us generate ideas and generate questions for future study or further study. Um, but we can't conclude causation. So we can't come up with new questions and develop new theories based on case studies. There are weaknesses, however. There's, there's probably as many weaknesses as there is um, strengths. So remember, we're just describing behavior. We're describing what has occurred in the past or what is currently occurring. Um, we, we can't, no matter how tempting it is, um, there's considerable room for error. So um, we have to be very careful um, about why something's occurring. Now, we do this all the time. We see somebody exhibit behavior during the day, and we make a conclusion 
based on that behavior, and we're usually satisfied with it. They're nice, that's why they helped me, or they're, they're looking for something from us, they're being selfish. Um, so we have to be pretty careful when we're trying to make conclusions about somebody's behavior in a, in a case study. Um, another weakness is that, remember, we gather this information from our records, um, from our notes. Um, it can be supplemented by things like test scores and other records, but um, it's, it's likely that um, we have to be careful for researcher bias and seeing what we want to see. And that's called the Rosenthal effect. And we'll, we'll bring that up um, later on in the unit. Additionally, um, it's very difficult for us to generalize from a case study of a person or group to the whole population. So we can't say, well, it happened, something happened to this person. So it's going to happen to everybody. Um, because there's, there's a lot of variables that we can't find. So we, we can't generalize from a person to the whole population. So we have to be very careful about that uh, and not making that mistake. So if we go to naturalistic observation, and, and again, you you do this a lot. Um, we watch people and we make conclusions. Uh, and in a case study, remember, we often look at past behavior and we gather a lot of records about something. In naturalistic observation, we're actually um, looking at behavior that's occurring in the moment, um, right away, um, that we're witnessing, if you will. And naturalistic observation means we're observing them in their natural environment. So it's a lot less restrictive than a laboratory. And we try not to disrupt behavior, but remember when there's a camera rolling, um, people's behavior can be affected. So um, there's a lot of places we can watch people. We can watch people on the subway. We can watch people in the lunchroom. We can watch people um, shopping. Um, we can watch people interacting with others. We can watch elementary school students uh, on the playground or at the zoo. Now, some famous naturalistic observation studies have involved animals. We can watch animals in the wild and, and how do they socialize and interact. Um, there's some problems that come with naturalistic observation, though, so we have to be careful. Now, if we're watching people, typically we have to tell them that they're being watched and possibly recorded. There are some exceptions that we'll talk about with that, however. And remember, once people know they're being observed, people tend to act differently. It's kind of like um, if you go on Facebook and look at pictures of people and their friends, and their friends are always doing things like this when they're getting their picture taken, or hey... Uh, that doesn't mean that's how they always act, because when there's a camera around, we tend to pose and act differently. Um, this is known as you know, reactivity or something called the Hawthorne effect, where subjects tend to want to be good subjects, or at least different types of subjects. Um, we can reduce this effect if we observe people for a longer period of time, and, and the subject tends to habituate, which means basically get used to and not notice the recording equipment or that we're watching them. And an example of this would have been uh, with Jane Goodall when she uh, observed apes in the wild that over time and many years, um, they got used to her and um, her presence had less of an impact on their behavior. So um, remember also we can reduce the Rosenthal effect or experimenter bias if we use more than one observer. So I might be biased in a certain way, but another observer isn't. So when we combine our data together, we can kind of get rid of those biases. Um, what can naturalistic observation tell us? Well, it certainly can tell us that a behavior actually happened. So if a, a kid did something that was very risky behavior, um, we know it occurred because we saw it happen. Um, this can help us generate new bits of information. Um, so, you know, say we, we wanted to um, see, you know, if, if males or females are more aggressive on the playground. Well, we can watch that happen. Um, and that can, that can help us generate more questions afterwards. So, I mean, we might observe third grade boys exhibiting risky behavior at recess. And gosh, you know, they're doing a lot of scary things. Third grade girls don't take as much risk, it doesn't seem like. So we might generate a question, I wonder if later on in life, that boys are going to take more risks than girls do um, because they do it at recess now. Maybe in the future, what if, uh, can we expect teenage boys to take more risks with drugs than girls do later on? 
So those are some questions that we may ask through naturalistic observation, but we cannot prove cause and effect. Remember, no cause and effect. So we're going to look at one more really quick. We're going to look at survey methods, and, and we're probably fairly familiar with this. This is how we can gather um, uh, information about people's attitudes, their opinions, their behavioral tendencies, and we can do that from a lot of people at the same time or in a short period of time. Um, it also allows us to assess a wider variety of behaviors. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit. And, and we can get a large sample size fairly easily here. Um, one of the big things that we don't think about is that we can study behavior through survey that might be unethical for us to study through naturalistic observations. Um, these things might be unethical behaviors such as drug use, embarrassing situations that might make people feel uncomfortable, um, or even other things like um, sexual attitudes or behaviors. So there are some unethical things that we can study, um, things that we'd have to intervene with if we saw, but through surveys we can ask some real personal questions as well. So, you know, it allows us to study a wider variety of, of behaviors. Um, now, we usually use some sort of questionnaire. Um, remember, we, we can't conclude causation based on our, our uh, data. We can only um, conclude that this is what those people that we surveyed thought at that time. So um, no cause and effect. We don't know why they think that way or what triggered them to think that way. Um, we have to be careful about that. And um, the accuracy of our data depends on a lot of things, how a question was framed. Um, do our subjects understand the question? Because sometimes questions can get pretty complex, and some students, because of language barriers or developmentally um, or experientially, they just they can't answer the question. Um, people may also want to look better, which is called social desirability effect. They don't take drugs or they um, don't cheat on tests, um, even if they're promised that their answers will be confidential. Sometimes people just want to look a different way. And sometimes people's memories are just flawed, so they don't remember correctly, and our data can be screwed up because of that. So, you know, we've talked about three. We've talked about case studies, uh, we've talked about naturalistic observations, and we've talked about surveys. So rewind if you have to. Make sure you can answer those objectives at the beginning of the video. And I want you to, to practice this question before you come back to class tomorrow. Suppose we want to find out if a student's gender at VAHS has an impact on how aggressive they are towards a referee at a varsity basketball game. So my question for you is, um, how would we do that? What would be the best descriptive method to use and why? And what would be an advantage and a disadvantage of that method? So good luck. Uh, we'll talk in class tomorrow.